Randall. I'm the director of the education practice here. Um, I have the great honor of introducing this panel. Um, who got an architect magazine this month? Mine was laying on the table when I got home last night, and it said, learn to serve across the front of it. So we are learning to serve with these fellow panelists. And then our moderator today, who some of you have met, I hope, is uh, Linda Nelson Keene. Uh, Linda and I have known each other for almost four decades. We met when we were babies. <laughs> and, and I have to say, I would not be an architect had I not met Linda Nelson. So Keene. So I'm very honored to introduce her. She is an artist, an architect an educator, uh, she started the architecture program at the Art Institute. Um, she's done so many things. She recently was honored with a local award for um, her next CC that she created with her husband, um, Mark Keene, from, uh, who teaches also. And hundreds of architecture students. And hundreds of architecture <laughs> students, who some of them may be in the audience, but some of them I have met recently. Um, so it, um, she's also an activist and an advocate for the water systems in Chicago. And she's got some cards that maybe she can speak to oh, at, the end. at the end. So um, without further ado, let's get the panel started. Okay, so this thank is you. track B. <laughs> yes, this is track B. And it comes right before the end of the day's keynote. So I'm really excited because this is a real diverse um, group of people here and we're gonna have a lively conversation. We're going to be talking about, we talked a lot about Chicago today, we've heard about that, we've heard about diverse practices, but we're going to be looking at how we as architects, as citizens of change, can activate thinking within our city and thinking within a region. And a good question is, can a city be successful if a region is not? And if the region is successful, does that just naturally make the city successful? What are those relationships? So first, I'm gonna reintroduce everybody, some um, just in case you were in track A the first time. And uh, now you can do picture matching. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, Ted Franco McCullough, who spoke her in track A this morning, is an urban designer and lecturer in architecture and urban design, art and urban planning in um, the University of, at the University of Michigan Top Women's College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Both her practice and her teaching advocates for equitable and healthy and socially just cities and communities that promote well-being and happiness. I like that. <laughs> she develops urban design and economic strategies at a range of scales from individual properties to entire regions and works with uh, institutions, developers, neighborhood groups, and complete cities. Her work spans urban design projects across the country from Flint, Michigan to LaGrange, Georgia, from Pittsburgh to Oklahoma City, from DC to her hometown, Boston, Texas. So Kit gets around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At the University of Michigan, Kit teaches design studios on housing and neighborhood development, which we will see some of the practitioners working in this, seminars on transportation and urban economics. And she also, and this is really rare, rarer than most people think, but a popular lecture course on real estate development for architects and planners. We too can be business developers. Um, and she is currently working on her book, which she spoke about, Car Light City, how the coming transportation revolution can improve our cities and our lives. Because cities are a place where people actually come, even though most of the roads that were developed since World War II are so that they can go through. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we're dealing with that. All right, and then to her right is Joel Kerner, who um, he's registered architect and principal of a research design practice studio of Joel Kerner. And his work is the subject of solo and group exhibits internationally, including the Centre Centre Pompidou, in Paris, the Architecture and Design Museum in LA, Apartment Project in Berlin, uh, Vero Center in Tallinn, and the Wedge Gallery at Woodbury. Prior to establishing this work, he worked in offices in Los Angeles at Morphosis and here in Chicago with Smith Gill. He has a Master of Architecture degree from SciArc, where he studied under the Pritzker Laureate Thomas Maine. 
Well, he is currently uh, an associate uh, professor at Syracuse, assistant professor at Syracuse University. You bumped me up there for a second. I was like, it's, it's on camera now. <laughs> I heard that sigh of relief. But he's very active being on crits and juries across the country as well. So he at IIT, USC, UNCC, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Urbana-Champaign, U of I, and so on in Woodbury. He also, between all of this work, between Syracuse, he actually has a practice here in Chicago that has worked on the Finkel site north of Goose Island. He recently also collaborated, uh, he gets around two, <laughs> with the Harvard University Graduate School of Design and the Hardbaka Ruins Project in Norway, a one-night stand for art and architecture. Um, and he also collaborates, continues to collaborate with the a and Museum in LA, where he acts as associate curator for the exhibit Architecture with a Capital A, Architecture with a Small A, and Architectural. I thought that would be otherwise. Those are <laughs> distinct. Distinct, but just to make sure. And this curatorial kind of writing practice, um, he fosters critical discourse by publishing an Arcanet's Crosstalk series Flat Journal, Revista and Gawa, Lunch Journal, Nam, Posit, and Seesaw, among others. So after we leave today, you can read his writings. All right, <laughs> so you. Joel. And then we just, uh, we're gonna jump to Stephen, who, or Ortega, who we spoke with earlier today up here on track B. He is, as you may, if you were here, he was a politician, which is very surprising for an architect because they don't really have time to do both of those things. <laughs> He's an active board member of the U.S. Green Building Council and a lead accredited professional. But interestingly enough, it was his service as a politician on the Committees of Commerce, Natural Resource, and Municipal Economies, or committees, that really started to embed his um, work in the na his native town. And it's very clear in the work that you do, Stephen, that you are committed to change and improving. He focuses on French immersion education and environmentally friendly initiatives and healthcare. Though his practice, which is small, as he claims, it's only been a year since three you? Years. Three years. Three years. You have three people? Yeah. Okay. It's actually starting to expand. So it includes historic preservation and adaptive reuse new designs for office buildings, townhouses, and mixed-use buildings, and master planning. He's done LEED certified houses, and he's developing mixed-use, high-density residential projects, and also working on school. So he's coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, he worked at the office of Mathis Briere Architects in New Orleans, and later for Make It Right in the Lower Ninth Ward after Hurricane Katrina. And Another thing, which is, sounds so humble, but is so powerful, is that he co-authored and led the bill that adopted the new Louisiana plumbing code for buildings. And my picture I took of him this morning was showing the watersheds around New Orleans and that part of Louisiana that were now coding districts, right, for stormwater management, which is a dream come true. The rest of the country could do that. It would change the way we work. And then finally, um, Jen McGray uh, is an associate professor of architecture at the University of Michigan at the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. And she teaches design studios and courses in sustainability and representation. Her professional experience, and this, I find this fascinating, having taken biology and botany in high school, <laughs> but she mixes architecture, her Master of Architecture, with Masters of uh, a BA in Biology and an MS in Evolutionary Biology and Ecology. <coughs> and I think this type of uh, translation from natural sciences into architecture and the movements of biophilia that Neil Wilson started, we spoke about, um, is really key in connecting architecture with the larger Earth So she, um, as she mentioned earlier, she worked with Maid Studio, where she worked in, on a lot of really amazing water maps that we can see. And um, now she's working with Ply Plus with Professor Craig Borum and William Carpenter. And their work at Ply Plus has received the Sarah New York Design Award of Excellence, Michigan AI Honor Award, Michigan Masonry Award, 
and is featured in the summer 29 issue of Day and Interiors. But I think MOCAD, we will see as an award. So thank you. See, we're just pro professing things here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that in mind, um, here's our region, right? Let's look at the big picture. Here we are from Google Earth. So big I couldn't even put it on the screen. <laughs> and other people have dissected this region um, in many interesting ways, showing all the cities that it includes. Um, I should have put in the picture, but the third coast that we're talking about shows the Pacific coast, and that which is short, then the Atlantic coast, which is longer, and then the third coast of the coastline of the Great Lakes, which is the longest. Okay, I did it wrong. The Pacific. <laughs> okay, the third. Coast. He's really a champion for Louisiana. <laughs> in Florida, Texas, and Alabama. Okay. <laughs> from the bird's eye view, right, lies the conundrum. We are looking at a territory which represents the fourth largest economy in the world. And its political boundaries are meaningless to climate change, to the way the world works as its nature. <coughs> it's only when we're down on the street, in between buildings, that it becomes politically demarked and organized and controlled. So the question for architects, like we can look at this scalar shift of nine scales, it was Sarah that who said, you know, you work on one scale and you touch other scales. We, many people think of architecture as the art of building, art and science of building buildings, but it's also the interiors of the building, it's the objects that go into it, it's the patterns that social and cultural that develop, the interactions, it's nanotechnology and smart spaces, and then it also is usually placed in a neighborhood or a location, and that location is part of a city, and that city is part of a region. So where does our work begin, and where does it end? So with that, we can start talking with Kit, since we have all these slides, but we're gonna get everything over Yeah, we can, but we also, yeah, we can curl around. I can put it up in the this moment. I think we can start, it's really a fine place to start with transportation. Can you speak closer to the mic, please? To make a city, to make a city, people have to collect there. And to collect there, they have to get there. And most cities started, where did most cities start? In the river. Yeah, by water, by the source of water, because air was really more ubiquitous, but fresh water was rare. And so we're gonna have this combination of transportation, water, green space, how do we live? What's our economy? All right. So I think one of your questions, Kit, was how can we create the city? Because we're looking at a city now, or not really what we architects would call it a city. We would call this a, a strip. <laughs> <laughs> or Duani would call it a commercial corridor, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, how can we create the city as a platform for individual action? to enable citizens to have agency and caring for their neighborhood. So who cares for this neighborhood, kid? Uh, the traffic engineer. Well, you know, I, I would say the traffic engineer, you know, you were talking about cities as places to go through. And, um, you know, this environment's designed entirely around moving the car. Uh, and that's the, its only purpose uh, for this uh, environment. So, um, uh, yeah. So I don't know how you know how to address the larger question, but um, you know this is what we should be doing, in my opinion, is um, designing the city that we want and asking the transportation system to Just support serve. and serve that. And that's probably true of all the systems that we're talking about. But we tend to uh, design and plan things in, in silos. It's the same thing with the, the water infrastructure um, uh, issues that were talked about in the earlier uh, 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 talk. So uh, you know, how can we look, how can we get the systems to serve the urbanism uh, rather than um, fitting everything to serve the systems? So there are certain things that won't change no matter how much times change. Some of them are the things people need. 
right? We all need access to food and friends and workplaces and places to have play and fun, but it's not equally distributed around our cities. And it's not equally served by transportation or clean water or trees and, um, or even by equitable housing. So those are systemic things within the city proper. They also are implicated by how the, the health of the region and how the region is led and how the region is envisioned by polit politicians, governments, institutions. Okay, I don't want to be rude, but we gotta pass the mic back and forth, sorry. <laughs> it's a rule. <laughs> okay, Joel. <laughs> um, Something this made me think about was um, I've, I've done some pro bono work on the south side of Chicago with Pullman, Alkel Gardens, Bobby and Woods, Golden Gate. Um, how, when you involve the community, how generic actually the responses are in terms of what they want and what they would like. And I'd say it's almost something that hasn't changed for decades. And we just want more light and we want more spaces to play and we want wider sidewalks. and. Uh, it's almost a little bit disheartening as a, as a designer maybe to hear these things because you're like, well, it's all, it's all kind of like business as usual, mm -hmm. which maybe drives us to be more insular as designers. Like, yeah, yeah, we got it. We know what you want. And mm -hmm. so let us just go in the room and design it all. So I find actually the, the public interface to be, to be quite a challenge because um, you want to set up these community sort of engagements and let them voice their opinions. But the more you experience that, the more you realize that whether it's in the south side of Chicago or it's in a different city, um, if it's other Rust Belt cities or wh whether it's Houston, it's, it's all kind of, uh, I feel like, similar answers in terms of what the community wants. So. Why then aren't they receiving them? If they keep asking over and over mm -hmm. the same things, why is it that those things aren't designed for them? Um, I, there's a, I think it's a lot of economic and regulatory environment pressures. And with that, I'll hand it to the politician. <laughs> <laughs> Recovering politicians. <laughs> uh, actually, and I, I like the image that you have okay. about it, um, because of the tra changing of transportation. Um, things like this actually start to put pressure on the on the policymakers to start to build the city more for multimodal. Because uh, Bird just shows up overnight. I think we had a, um, South Park had a crazy episode where. The birds just showed up overnight. <laughs> no, that's how they come, just yeah, like birds do. <laughs> so that, that, um, we were laughing about it one week in my office about that episode, and literally the next week the birds showed up in Lafayette, Louisiana. <laughs> and uh, people went crazy, and, and it really activated our urban core more than usual. Um, and it was like, now half the people um, are riding around on scooters and the other half the people are walking around playing Pokemon. <laughs> and so it's funny how things like apps um, start to change people's perception of the city, but then all of a sudden now you have to, you have to start spending money on bike lanes for people's safety because you have people running around with bird scooters on flip-flops with <laughs> no helmets. <laughs> But this is one of the things that, uh, as a developer, I've seen the investors in the projects we're doing in our downtown. Uh, one of the big things in a suburban environment is where's the parking? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But this is one thing that the develop. I mean, the investors in these projects keep saying, uh, "When are the birds going to come back?" Mm -hmm. Or the the lime or whatever they they have all of these gotcha. Yeah, different um, names. So, because they actually realized that regulatory, they didn't have any rules, so they had to come back, and now it's, you know, the wheels of government taking their time to be able to, um, to come up with rules to get them to come back to our city. But the investors keep saying, well, we want more of those because then we can do more of these projects mm -hmm. because they're denser and we don't need the market. So, uh, so, I think what it is, people want to have fun, right? This was fun. Like, it could be a spike of fun. Like, we used to have skateboards, and now there's just really the skateboard crew, and the other people are like, no, not for me. But it's fun. <laughs> but this is still, like, a, a vibe. And um, the fun factor is hard to plan into participatory community design and planning. You're trying to have some fun, though, at MoCAD. It's 
certainly looks like it. Well, we always try to have fun. If you're gonna <laughs> if you're gonna do these things, you do the best you can. I mean, what I find interesting about about this example, um, and and what what Kid and Joel are saying is that um, I think part of the challenge of being um, designers, but also community members, um, is is building a collective imagination because sometimes there are things that would completely transform whatever it is, transportation, water, you know, name it, public space, that we haven't seen before in a certain way, so we don't know to ask for it. Um, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't want the outcome of something like this, but we say it in a different way, in a way that perhaps is generic because um, well, words are, are imprecise in certain ways, and so are the drawings that we make. Um, in other ways. So I, I think representation is a pretty interesting part of the puzzle um, in terms of, of representing um, possibilities or options or at least getting a conversation started. Sometimes eliminating possibilities is as productive as um, offering new ones. So I, I might bring that question back to Kit for a moment in terms of um, when you're working on larger scale, and it, it's the same for water in some way, but transportation I think is even more challenging because you're dealing with um, you're dealing with people who have a very strong um, experience set of what they've experienced before with transportation and perhaps what they expect. So a lot of us, you know, there there are classic studies about mostly food. When people are asked what kind of coffee they want, light or dark, everybody says dark, even though when you do taste tests, everybody likes light coffee. It's just that we somehow have a misassociation between things. And I think the same thing happens with cities. What we ask for is sometimes different than what we actually really love. Um, so how do you deal with conversations, representation, opening up that conversation so that people can express interest in something that maybe isn't Paris, Woodward is a long way from that, but um, it was a few images ago, or, or I'm not sure what city it was, um, but could be a kind of amazing future for Detroit that's unique to it, but still accomplishes a beautiful city where transportation serves it. Yeah, I think that those are all really excellent points, and, and, and what's been good about the birds is that they did just show up <laughs> and they didn't ask anybody. If they'd asked people, they, they wouldn't have come. <laughs> and it, and, <laughs> and a rule for architects, just show up. Yeah, it. right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's it that says 99% in life is showing up? <laughs> and, um, and I think that's true for a lot of the disruptions that we've been seeing in mm -hmm. the transportation. Uber, Lyft, uh, the meal delivery, Zipcar, car to go, and, um, and then things that you know that you know we can't even imagine, and it's because people are, I think, questioning the status quo. That uh, it, the reason you know these disruptions are successful is because they need to be disrupted, <coughs> uh, um, and so uh, so it is. But at the same time, it is disruptive, and people do push back because it is change and and then the regula regulatory you know system has to, to catch up but I, I think this method of working um, it, there, there's something to learn from that and uh, the other example I think of is um, the tactical urbanists mm -hmm. who you know go out and, and sometimes without permission you mm -hmm. know paint in bike lanes or crosswalks or <laughs> put in things that you know you know that really really there. yeah that should that should be there, that people see a need for, um, but isn't happening through the regular, you know, top-down um, structure of doing things. But um, maybe Stephen has uh, a, <laughs> a better um, uh, uh, perspective on uh, regulatory versus tactical and bottom-up. I, <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you have thoughts. Yeah, I think it's a dialectical relationship, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, they can push each other. Sometimes government can push private uh, industry, and sometimes industry can push government. In the case of birds showing up, obviously, it's private industry being innovative and pushing the government. Um, but th there, it goes the other way, too. I, th I think that, um, obviously, we talk about like um, zoning with like the for for form-based zoning. Um, <laughs> starts to force people, or even uh, rules on our taxes, 
uh, or fees or whatever that, that uh, force private um, developers to think about uh, rainwater collection or to think about putting a percentage of glazing on, on the walkable street. Um, you know, that sort of thing that, that might not come unless you have government regulations. So, um, your hometown is full of scooters. Yeah, and they, they, they make so She's much from sense. <laughs> You're a lot quieter than motorcycles. Yeah, and it, I think these talks today, all the talks, it's really interesting to see kind of where the discussion is going in terms of the regulatory environment. And, and in a lot of cases, the, the codes or, or zoning lacks far behind the technology or the advances that are happening, which I think is why a lot of things don't get implemented. But at the same time, certain things, um, like I think, Kit, you were mentioning in your lecture, that we're required to provide certain amounts of parking for new developments. And if you, if you include that parking to service the current demand, then it doesn't put pressure or incentive to people to stop using their cars, and we end up in this perpetual cycle where for decades we don't get out of the loop. Um, but if the regulatory environment is more stringent in those sense, in terms of more stringent um, energy demands or, or less parking and things like that, um, but more loose and free in terms of form-based codes and things like that, then it can really start to push change really rapidly. So, uh, Joel, on that, I was talking in my lecture that we recently adopted form-based zoning in Lafayette, and my very first project that we did, we figured that there's actually a cap on the amount of parking that you can have in this particular site, and it was based because it was an office building. Well, the thing is, is the, the zoning didn't take into consideration what type of office building. So this was um, a title company that did closings, so you'd have three or four closings going on at a time, and you have the realtor and the banker and the, the owner and then the seller and then their realtor and their, you know, and so you have all these people arriving at, at this place, and, and they definitely didn't have enough parking for this certain thing. So sometimes um, that, that sort of regulation um, can't get as detailed as real life sort of things. So you start to, as, you, as these case study, these scenarios start to play out, you start to realize that thing. But they also, I noticed this image, uh, <laughs> only half of it is filled up, but I actually really like this building. I like the fact that it tells you, hey, we have parking on the bottom. <laughs> but it reminds me there's a project in New Orleans that is about to open that was an old parking garage that they, um, it's a historic parking garage because they got historic tax credits. And I was telling them about it. <laughs> and um, it, it, the floor plate's so big that they were able to keep parking in it, but they put a, par a car elevator in it. Just so you up take there. up to your floor and you park, so it's like the best of urban environment and the best of <laughs> urban environment together. Um, but uh, it's um, it. One of the things that they were finding was that the parking garage was built with so much more um, less tolerance of, of measurements that when they start oh, to build it out build as a, a um, multi-family, it's like a lot of changes. Yeah, a lot of change orders in that project. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> But I'm wondering, you know, at what point does a building like this start to become condos mm -hmm. from the top down? Um, just like the conversion of the, the it's called the garage. And yeah. imagine what those would sell for. Yeah. <laughs> it's real, oh, go ahead. No, that, that, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think this is one thing that transportation has to really focus on, that we really don't want canyons of 10 and 12 stories of parked cars that that's really not a pedestrian environment, and it's not really conducive to interaction and safety on the street, everything Jane Jacob writes about it. But what we need to do is to look at the same information that Elizabeth was showing us today about the automatic, uh, automated vehicles. Like, have we reached peak car? <laughs> Can we say have we reached peak car? It's just going to decline from here in good urban cities. Um, I don't think we have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying it out. I mean, maybe in very large cities. I actually think medium-sized cities. I recently got to visit with our chamber of commerce, uh, Greenville, South Carolina. If y'all are familiar with it, and their downtown is like booming. And the reason their downtown is booming is because. 
because they realized that the only way they can get developers to start developing their surface parking was for the city to build parking garages. So they, they, their um, mayor and um, deputy mayor said, well, we see getting into the parking business as economic development. That's what they said. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've heard Albuquerque is doing the same thing, where the city, the medium-sized cities, there's not enough of a market to be able to pay for building a uh, structured parking. But if the city invests in structured parking, it all of a sudden frees up all of this surface parking to be able to get that density. So I think there's, in some ways, a lot of, um, a lot of cities are going to have first go that route to, to make available uh, to, raise the to be able to start to increase the density. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think we've hit that peak yet, even with Uber and Bird and everything. Yeah, yeah, this morning I talked a little bit about um, shared parking and parking as a utility, and um, but I didn't talk about the economic impacts um, so much. But, uh, the reason cities should be in the parking business rather than making developers and individuals uh, park all the cars is for this very economic reason. Developers will tell you that the parking is a loss leader. They're not going to make enough money from uh, the parking to pay for it, which means that everybody you know, renting in the buildings and subsidizing that parking, whether they have a car or not. And it also makes it really difficult for projects to pencil out, especially someplace like Detroit, where the rents aren't quite high enough to um, cover that cost. And so if the city builds it, then they can um, locate it strategically, where it can do the most good. Uh, um, they can also build it in a way that when we do hit peak car, and I'm more optimistic that that'll be sooner. <laughs> Thank you, uh, <laughs> That um, uh, uh, That uh, then, um, you know, we can, they can build, you know, cheap, freestanding decks as a way um, to preserve developable sites and then uh, those um, garages can be torn down and, and redeveloped. Um, but in the course of building up, I mean that brings up two questions, a private-public partnership and that would shift the partnership, the developer wouldn't have to carry the whole load, it would shift it to the city and I think that that's something that each architect, every architect has to have conversations, so they're not always acting in isolation. That and then the second thing would be that there would be guidelines that you could not have four corners of parking garages or four Starbucks. I guess, yeah, uh, or some, some people call it um, three P's or whatever, public, public PPP, anyway. So uh, I've actually been dealing with, with a lot of this in, on the development side because we were realizing in a project, uh, can you show that project? Yes. The, the, the mixed one. use one? Mm -hmm. We realized in this project that we were spending almost 4% of the construction costs in the public right away on drainage and sidewalks and parallel parking. And um, yeah. so we were trying to ask for the city to give us a pilot, which is a pay in lieu of tax. So for, I think all we needed was five years of holding the property taxes to where they were to pay for that infrastructure that was a public good. Um, and it's kind of funny because a house a block from here, the lady put the cone out in the parallel parking, but she's the one who made the improvement to the parallel parking. So I was like, can we like just rope off our parallel parking since we're <laughs> paying for it? Um, but, but now, actually with that conversation, now the city is looking at doing an economic develop, uh, what they call EDD, economic development district, in the whole area to help pay for things like that infrastructure, but also for sewer, because there, there's a sewer capacity. Um, uh, challenge that, that's mm -hmm. in this area also. So, you know, at some point, how do you start to pay for all of this stuff? And, and how is it an investment? Um, just like building the parking garage, all of a sudden your property, your property taxes that you're collecting on the surface area of parking mm -hmm. ends up paying for that garage pretty yeah. quickly. Um, but, but the city's partnering up with the private developers is important to make sure that you actually get someone paying for that for that parking garage or sewer or sidewalks drainage but um, so yeah. 
I think, like, I'm just looking, first I thought those might be bike racks on the corner there. I don't know. And I was thinking that you should get a tax cut. If you, you know, if you're building, and all of a sudden, hello, we're going to have 300 new people living here. So what is the number that qualifies for a new, not only bike rack, but then also the Velos or whatever, yeah. the different bike companies. And that's a lot, I, you see all these towers that are going up on the South River. Who has thought about the bike racks for those people? Are they incorporated? <laughs> Good. So I don't know about Chicago, but uh, a lot of cities, Portland, Seattle, usual suspects, <laughs> they um, uh, now require uh, bike garages as part of the, the apartment buildings, which is, you know, if, if we're going to require parking, we might as well require bike parking. So um, they're requiring bike parking instead of car parking. Uh, they're also requiring, um, you know, zip cars or car to goes in the buildings as well. So it makes it um, easier for people to live without their own car. Is there a shift in, um, in, in private public that the requirements for parking are shifting from public to private or vice versa? And how does that relate to the cohesiveness of what a city actually looks like? And how it functions. Yeah, I mean, if every developer's in charge of his own kind of parking design, you know, how does that, how does the cohesiveness work versus if it's a public decision? Yeah, so, so not many cities, I think, are um, taking on parking as a public utility. Uh, maybe in some downtown, so uh, downtown Ann Arbor, it's a, a public utility. So the it's still kind of business as usual where the developers are expected to provide the parking on site as part of the development. I do think that's going to change in the next four or five years because what's happening is you, we see the affordability in cities like Chicago or Portland um, that the desirability to go to the big cities is so high that the demand causes the rent to go up so high. So what happens is now you have all the medium-sized cities that are, that are more affordable. Uh, places like Albuquerque or Knoxville or Lafayette. And or Milwaukee. Or Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> and, 600, but, you know, and so they're more affordable, but, um, but people still want to have that urban feel and that downtown feel. So the only way those cities are going to be able to compete is to be able to get into the parking business so that their urban areas can start to, to develop more dense, more like the bigger cities. And I think in the next 10 years, you're gonna see all these medium-sized cities, their downtowns are gonna start to look a lot more like Chicago. Maybe not this tall, but um, you'll see a lot of um, five and six story buildings um, because the rents are gonna be low enough, so low that you're gonna have, they're gonna have to build it with um, in wood construction and not steel or concrete because you have to have really high rents to be able to afford to go steel or concrete and with the with the um, with the current building codes that's the highest you can go in, in wood any comments <laughs> chicago sell off Um, I thought it was an interesting dynamic. I watched um, Elizabeth's lecture, and, and she's from CMAP, and it was all about autonomous vehicles and, and how we're planning and producing that. To contrast that with your lecture upstairs, which was all about giving space back to the people and, and get these cars out of here. Um, and and, and it, it, I think it is going to be some type of balance, but I think some of the points um, that Stephen's bringing up isn't, isn't accounting for autonomous vehicles and maybe the planning that there are people coming from the outside that need to service these, these districts with a privatized vehicle, but it could be autonomous and, and drop them off at their location, and then the cars all go stack themselves in a more compact garage somewhere else. Um, and even, even before the advent of autonomous vehicles, places like Japan have started to 
uh, stack vehicles into like vehicle vending machines, basically that stack into much smaller areas. So I just think it's ridiculous for us to continue to plan for car parking and car storage in a way that we have for the for decades now, where uh, individual people are going and parking their car in these wide aisles and, and high ceiling heights. So I think it's a it's a combination of either rethinking it altogether in terms of compact uh, space, but also um, where that is distributed in the city. So it's no longer in the cores, but it's on the periphery. And what comes to <coughs> mind is, is um, Norman Foster has been working on Mazdar City in the in the desert um, for a long time. This is in UAE, mm -hmm. and that plan is is a hyper dense pedestrian core where you barely see the, the, the public realm from, from an aerial view, let's say, because the space is so collapsed, you don't need that infrastructure in the core, but on the periphery are big parking garages where the vehicles go park themselves. And, and this is actually already happening in Detroit, uh, uh, in the Midtown area um, where land values are so high uh, uh, that um, you know, it doesn't make sense to build above grade parking but the uh, rents economics won't um, support below grade parking. It's actually cheaper when you've got cheap land on the periphery to offer valet parking to your tenants. And so uh, there's no parking on site, very little parking, and there's a valet that takes your car um, you know, off to, the, to the a remote site. And then brings it, oh, they do that in Amsterdam as well, so you don't have to do it in the And, and you know, it's explained to me by a developer that now uh, it becomes an operating cost rather than a development cost and this mm -hmm. figures into the way the financing is structured. So that, I mean, I think, let's talk about water and how we can address this. Yeah, enough about parking. <laughs> <laughs> They're related. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing to, uh, of concern to architects as you look out and the city start to point out their developable land, not their individual vacant lots, which then can have different small move strategies, but for instance, like the 78, it's you know all the acreage at the South River. What architect may develop that? At what point is a project too big for one person to do, or one firm to do it all? And I, when we look at the water, it's too big for one person to say, this is what we're doing. So we, we landed on the, the watershed political boundary map, um, <laughs> which, which I think is, is actually at the heart of um, Maybe not so much the parking, but but the conversation about um, maybe attitudes about site um, and, and distribution. So the discussion about the parking being offsite in valet, or versus thinking about every site having to hold everything. I think is an interesting way to think about flexibility more generally. Um, and and this drawing was really trying to advocate for um, a different kind of flexible thinking that isn't consolidating everything, in this case, into a political boundary and limiting power and conversation um, around municipalities when, when we're trying, trying to talk about other systems that, that work in different logics. Um, and we saw that in, in Stephen's talk as well, which is why I was so excited about um, the watershed moments. Like, oh my goodness, I didn't know somebody accomplished this. It's great. Just have another <laughs> well, and, and that's exactly why um, the conversation is more difficult here in this region, I think Chicago as well, um, is that we don't have that, we have the presence of water, you can walk by the river, it, it's raining today, we have localized puddles or problems, but, but not the kind of massive flooding and complete um, devastation and, um, and, and force of water that, that you are showing us today. And so water is, when it's more abstract or more removed, um, it, it does have a different imaginary or a different understanding. Um, and you know, to some degree, I think part of what, what we were trying to do with representation is just bringing water back to the conversation relative to urbanism. Because even though we don't see it as clearly, the things that we do and, and the decisions that we make in the Great Lakes region have just as strong of an influence, um, but it's harder, it's, it's harder to notice. Um, so I, I think um, 
I don't know, I think there are a lot of alignments. We have the opposite problem. Water, water's too invisible. You have the problem that water is too, too visible <laughs> yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, but it leaves us in a similar way of, of extending conversation. Yeah, so I guess, actually, like, if I drive to New Orleans from Lafayette, probably 40% of my drive is on a bridge. So that's, that's the type of water that we live with. Um, when you drive to Baton Rouge, it's probably 50%. So it, there's a lot of water, and uh, it, you know, and when I got in the legislature and we were looking at, at trying to do these districts, the uh, water management districts, uh, one of the states that we found did, did it really well was actually Florida. And I realized that Florida did it well because um, they were so dependent on tourism, and that's their main industry. And so they're trying to protect their beaches and they're trying to protect their waterways in a totally different way because it's an economic thing. Um, for us, uh, it, navigating the waterways is an economic thing. Uh, when you have the largest port in the world housed in, in all this water. And um, the, uh, in the past, the oil and gas canals, to be able to get to the oil and gas, um, that was an economic thing. So now it's like, it's not necessarily an economic reason, it's more of a reaction to, well, we're gonna drown if we don't create these districts now. So um, I think um, a lot of times, and I think this is everywhere, I don't think it's just in the United States, but we're very uh, reactive and not um, proactive. I mean, even in the Netherlands, it's like they started getting um, very active after major flooding events also, so uh, from the North, North Sea. When it, but that's kind of the crisis management, you wait till it happens, it's not the preventative measure, it's in response. And there's, that's a different way of operating. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that they can hear. Um, I actually, we were talking about parking and water, but in my presentation, I was talking about how we always use our parking lots as detention. It's a it's a tertiary system, so it, it's the last resort. So it's whenever you're getting a major major flood event, uh, we will store water in our parking lots. Um, usually, after it gets to six inches, we have an overflow because we don't want to get water in the cars. But um, I know but you can think if you have, I mean, the, the car average car space is. What, 19 by 18 feet by 9 feet and then they have the backup area behind it there's a lot of it's concrete 300 300 to 350 square feet per space yeah kid, kid yeah she's <laughs> got it now so Joel what's going on in this drawing um, what are you suggesting to us uh, well uh, to segue into this um, based on what we were just talking about stormwater uh, a lot of what I think about in my practice is, is um, there's a lot of surface in the city. The roof of a building is a surface. A uh, place for children to go play in a park, that's a surface. A space to collect storm water for it to seep into the ground, that's a surface. A place to go park your car is a surface. <laughs> and for me, a lot of these issues, um, or, or even her, urban uh, heat island effect, and you want to reflect the light back, that's a surface issue. So I think a lot of these issues have to deal with reducing the redundancy of surface. And can these things be um, serve multiple modes or stack spatially on top of each other so that they occupy a smaller footprint? And, and a lot of the reference models, at, at least for me, but I think a lot of my colleagues are places like Europe or Japan that have had very compact, small cities for many, many centuries. And, and, and have, yes, and have been forced to layer these systems rather than have the luxury to just expand out. Um, so, so in Japan, um, Atelier Bawao did a really nice compendium, a guidebook to the idiosyncratic architecture of Tokyo that you're never going to see in, a, in an amazing architecture book about cool architecture in Tokyo. And it's <laughs> things like um, recreation courts on top of sewage treatment plants with a train shooting underneath that has a shrine on it. And these amazing <laughs> amalgamations that are just incredible. So a lot of my work focuses on that. Like, how do you get these idiosyncratic clustered things that aren't the one size fits all answer for the city? Um, so with this one, this is some of my early work. This is Los Angeles, uh, one of the most, at least at the time, like the epitome of sprawling, uh, disastrous American city. How do we save this and rectify it? And so I'm influenced by old, dense, 
idiosyncratic urbanism, and how do you, how do you inject the flavor of that into LA? Um, and the idea that maybe there's legible networks that still carry through that aren't an exact uh, modernist orthogonal grid. Um, what I realized doing this work is that it, it's just a cartoon. Like it's just, how do you ever design all these conditions? These conditions can only happen um, naturally over time through different input and different people. And as much as this is a sort of swath of wouldn't this be cool, it's still one architect and it's still one hand and it's still this, this very modernist idea that you can master plan everything and figure it all out and then everyone for decades has to follow along with it. So I've, so I've strayed away from this. Uh, maybe you can yes. advance, I, I forget what else I put in here. Um, so I'm leaning more towards diagrams like this, which I find very helpful not only for myself as a designer and other colleagues, but also um, for the public to understand something like this. We all understand Central Park uh, as a big void in Manhattan. Uh, we, it's in this <coughs> rectangular box, so it's a very curated, idyllic, manicured scene of nature within the city. Um, but we don't have a lot of rough ecological space. And, and in, so this, this was a project for um, a new um, satellite campus for Cornell University. And what we found out in the research doing this was that um, Roosevelt Island used to have more ecological diversity than Yellowstone and Yosemite Park combined. And that's nowhere to be found in Manhattan anymore. And although you can find these uh, park spaces, green space, public space for people, uh, there's all these species of animals that were wiped out. Um, and so this was a proposal to connect Central Park over, um, stuff the density of that campus in a very, very, very small footprint of what the site was allotted and give the rest back to ecological space. Let it be wetland. Let these species come in and have a place of respite as they move through. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, I'll just run through these really, really quickly because I think they all relate to each other. Um, this, and then so moving away from the idea of master plan and more of these layered idiosyncratic projects that start to deal with, try to attempt to deal with multiple issues in one little locality. Um, this is the central square in Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, which if you Google Tallinn, it drops the pin right here. Mm. This is their front door, but, but it's the busiest intersection of Tallinn. There's three trams going through here um, and completely devoid of human activity. And on the left is the old dense medieval city and on the right was the modernist Soviet city. And so the, the center of Tallinn is kind of this void between the two. Um, so this was a, a, a competition of what do you do with this space? Um, so we looked at um, some precedents in Spain and in Japan. Uh, let's sink the transit. Let's try to cover back over the, the, the hole there to establish a public realm again. <coughs> what if we thicken that public realm to try to give some um, flexible space? So at the time, this was when co-working was starting to happen. So is that a co-working space? And it's not this, uh, let's say, corporate tenant office. Um, and then what we noticed was a lot of the successful public realm spaces in the precedents we were looking at all had this very contained spatial aspect of being contained within an urban room and that was really missed here with this blown out kind of uh, Soviet city. Uh, so we used architecture as the frame then to establish and, and kind of cut this space for this new activity to emerge. So I, I think in my work this is what I'm leaning towards is, is these unique projects that you can hope that over a broad period of time can uh, stitched together with multiple voices and, and create something that's uh, more of a solution for, for these urban issues. What's interesting about this is it, it invites ownership that wasn't possible before, right? You said people weren't there because it was a transit space. And now it's inviting people from multiple um, entries to do multiple things at multiple levels. And it's not necessarily like the mega architecture that um, I know some of the other countries that are growing cities so large are trying to do, or the same kind of modernist vision that's very stagnating what life there is like. Um, it's actually full of variety and probably full of flexibility because it's very different. I actually thought when I looked at this, because we talked about gray water and your interest mm -hmm. in gray water, and I was thinking, okay, he's stacking water. Let's see. He's gonna have <laughs> Tell me about the gray water and over surfaces and things. Okay, so not gray water, but gray space. Yep, so gray space. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with figure ground drawings. The typical drawing of the mode to represent buildings contrasted with urban space. 
So buildings are represented in black in the drawing, and then the urban space, everything between them is represented in white. But there's a lot of projects happening now that you can't represent them with that pure black and white. They're kind of gray. So an example that comes to mind is the Oslo Opera House in Norway, which is a big performing arts center, but the roof of it is this amazing plaza that everyone walks up on and wants to take selfies and look over Oslo and look over the fjord, and it's amazing. Um, and so how do you represent that in the drawing? Because if you're talking about public realm, you need to show that as a piece of public realm and mm -hmm. the extension of people up onto it. Uh, but if you're talking about it as an architecture piece, of, a building, you need to represent that as black. Um, so a lot of these projects, so this one, for example, the plinth of this is stuffed with office space, but people are walking up on that. There's transit happening below. Can you start to get three or four or X amount of layers of these different things happening to, to not only foster a whole mix of people happening in there, but also uh, try to cancel out the spread of these different systems, let's say. So I would say less about water and more about right, a layered space. Mm -hmm. So for example, big box stores, which, which are more or less falling into decline now, um, that the, the roofs of them are just these big open surfaces. What do you do? Do you use those to handle storm water? Do you start to put parks on top of there? Do you start to put, if people are so attached to their idea of privatized housing, their individual house with their white picket fence in their yard, put those on top of the big box stores. Find a way to increase those layers of density within the city. And I think uh, Louis Sermaki Lewis did a proposal years ago, probably a decade ago, that was called New Suburbanism, which was a speculation on that, which I thought, which I thought was, was way more interesting than, than the Dwani approach. <laughs> Um, so, Joel, one thing I find interesting about this and the idea of using having multiple architects in it is it kind of reminds me of in historic preservation, they have a word, I think it's a German word, they call it palimpsest. And it's like over time you've added things, and different people have added different things. I mean, even, even when we saw uh, Notre Dame burn down, we realized that, well, wait, the spire is actually 200 years old, even though the whole building is 900 years old. So it's palimpsest, it's layers, mm -hmm. and, and it's different architects. Um, so, and that's what you see in cities, and I think that's what people really love about cities. Um, if you go, but sometimes you can't afford multiple architects. Can you go to that one? Which one? one? That one. Okay. Yeah, all right. So, in, in the case of, um, this was a master plan, but we were trying to get that, um, that, everything being different, but the developer was not going to go and hire multiple architects. I mean, he could barely hire me. Um, so it, what we did was we were like, well, let's create different typologies. And, and so we created three different typologies for people in different points in their life. So one was those who, uh, like a starter home for young families, and then the other one was for young professionals, which we forgot about the divorcees, which were the ones who were buying a lot of them. And then, um, and then also uh, the empty nesters. And it was really interesting to see the people who actually bought them almost always lined up with who we were trying to design them for. So it was very, and we never told them this. We just mm -hmm. showed them the plans and this is what they went for. Um, but then we created a matrix of materials and colors and um, different doors. Every door in this project is a little bit different. But one of the things that inspired me was uh, West 8, who's a landscape architecture firm in, um, are they in the Netherlands? Yeah. yeah. Um, had done a, a project uh, for Neos Foreign Board where they took an, an, old, um, an old port and converted it into a neighborhood. And it was a, it was a low density or um, low rise dense neighborhood, kind of like this. Uh, but they, they actually designed it out to where multiple architects could do it. And unfortunately, like I said, this developer was not going to hire multiple architects. So we said, well, let's just try to at least get some sort of urban effect for a, a, a new development that, uh, that is a different answer than, than the Diwani model of creating, I call it Disney World, um, where we just plaster on and try to make up a history. Um, we weren't trying to do that. We were trying to be of its place and of its time, not just, um, you know, Tuscany in the 1400s, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like thinking about, um, like, Olive Garden. 
I really, I, I can see the Borneo Sporenberg here. It's quite interesting. Um, it, you know, you get diversity out of a simple set of rules for, for to some degree. Um, but I, I think maybe um, what what the conversation has got me thinking about is is um, the outcome of different forms of maybe scarcity, if we want to call it that, whether it's economic or otherwise. Um, also, in terms of partnerships, it's not exactly the case here. I think the scarcity is what we get a certain amount of um, uh, innovation in terms of how to get this variability with very, very simple means. Um, in other cases like Detroit, if, um, if Detroit were to um, try to tackle something like the, the, the Tallinn competition, um, it would undoubtedly need uh, a conversation with many, many parties to be thinking about that because it's not a single entity who can kind of um, put the means um, at, at play to, to accomplish something like that. Um, and in the case of Detroit, um, it really means that um, both for better and maybe not worse, but, but, but challenging, which um, if any of you were in track A and saw Maria's talk earlier today, she brought up some of the, um, um, the possible concerns that happen when um, something like a, a foundation or, or um, others um, take the place of, of municipal oversight um, and have a lot of money and have a lot of power because of it. But on the flip side, it mean, also means a lot of nonprofits are, are in the mix and talking about um, cities and have a big place to uh, a big role to play. Um, so it, it's not so much about the housing, but um, but I, what I find interesting about um, thinking about all of these different projects is is just that is it's very not just developer model of public-private mm -hmm. partnerships, but there's a lot of different models of partnerships that are starting to um, develop um, that could mean really exciting outcomes, sometimes mean really challenging partnerships. Um, I didn't show it, but one of the projects that, um, one of the, the last projects I worked at when I was with MADE was to do a series of um, kayak lockers or design a kind of prototypical kayak locker for a water trail um, that was being developed on the Huron River in Ann Arbor. Um, and so it was one of these kind of challenges because there were five different cities that all wanted to participate in the water trail. It was a branding exercise, but all the cities had different ideas about whether it should be visible or not so visible and what kind of aesthetic it should have. Um, and then eventually we, we got one built um, in one test case, which was the city of Ann Arbor. Um, and so a nonprofit, the Huron River Watership Council, paid for the fabrication and the design of this um, to some degree. They, they paid for the fabrication for sure. It was like a partnership to, to, to get the design ideas out. Um, the city provided a park space. Um, and then, um, and it, it's a very modest little structure um, that houses, um, it has six little pockets and depending on your boats, you can shove a bunch in or, or only one. Um, but there was a very long period of time, probably six months, where there were negotiations between the city and the nonprofit um, about who is going to take care of this and what happens when somebody get, gets hurt or if somebody gets hurt or, you know, these kinds of conversations that um, they, they worked it out. Um, but, you know, it's these kinds of partnerships are both really promising, but they're also challenging because there aren't necessarily models for them. Um, so I think we're going to see more and more complex partnerships evolving, and it would be really, I, yeah, I don't know who and how they all communicate, but it would be super interesting um, for, I don't know, the representation of, of the positive outcomes, the ways that people figure out how to work together to somehow be um, shared as well, so that not everybody has to start solving the same problem over and over again. When I was in the legislature, we uh, had gotten the National Paddle Trail on one of the waterways through, through my district. And we were getting a grant uh, that was going to be specifically to one of these towns. And they didn't want it. It was the strangest thing. They didn't want uh, a, uh, a launch because they thought, oh, there'll be strangers are going to come here and launch. <laughs> so I simply called the other town over and asked them if they wanted it and then they wanted it because they're always calling, they were always calling my office begging for money. So, um, <laughs> so we were like, let's give it to them. 
then the, the, the other town got really jealous and then they wanted it back. So <laughs> it's kind of funny to see how sometimes people do it just because they see someone else doing it. I'm, I'm stealing the mic. It's 4.15 and we're going to have to move downstairs. <laughs>